circumstances may be going on around us if we know Jesus and we're in his hand it'll be all right it'll be all right in the end it's going to be okay if you got a storm going on in your life right now put your faith your trust in him and it's going to be all right open your Bibles please to Colossians chapter number three some of the guys were uh, teasing me a little bit a, a, a while ago about length of messages. <laughs> they, 
some sermons are longer than others. You know, some preachers preach a long time, others preach real short, and some are in between. I think, I think most of us agree that I preach pretty short, don't I? Yeah. I got one friend. <laughs> Miss Charlotte's on my side. Yeah. The difference is she's just spiritual and she likes to get more of the Word of God. See? <laughs> Speaking of time, I heard about the uh, three men standing on the hill, and uh, one of them took his wristwatch off and, and threw it down the hill, and it broke. The second one pulled his wristwatch off and threw it down the hill, and it broke. The third one took his wristwatch off, and he threw it down the hill, and then walked down the hill and caught it before it hit the ground. And the other two guys said, how did you do that? He said, my watch is five minutes slow. <laughs> Our clock is five minutes slow, so we'll get it all in today, all right? Colossians chapter number three, verse number one. Colossians chapter three and verse number one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then look down at verse number 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all, watch this, but Christ is all and in all. I want to preach the message this morning entitled, When Christ is All. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in these few moments that we have and Lord, help our hearts to be focused on heavenly things. Lord, you said in the passage of Scripture before us that we're to set our hearts and our attention, our affection on things above. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to put the things that would uh, demand our attention aside right now and let the Lord Jesus and His Word and His Spirit have our attention this morning. I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, change us because we've been here and heard thy precious word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me ask you a question this morning. What is Jesus Christ to you? What is Jesus Christ to you? You say, well, Jesus has a place in my life. No, he didn't ask for a place in your life. He doesn't want a place in your life. You say, Jesus has a big place in my life. He didn't want a big place in your life. You know what Jesus wants in your life? He wants all. He wants to have the preeminence in your life. He wants everything. He desires and demands to have our pre his preeminence in our life. He wants our full attention and our full affection. Now, in the passage of Scripture we read, I think, when we come to verse number 11, when it says, but Christ is all and in all. I think that leaves nothing out. What do you think? He says Christ is all. In other words, to the Christian, Jesus is everything. He's everything. We don't have a secular part of our life and a sacred part of our life. Jesus is everything. Now, that's a big question. What is Jesus to you? Is Christ all for you, or do you just fit him in somewhere? Now, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 21, the Bible says, For me to live is Christ. Hey, did you hear that? The Apostle Paul said, For me to live is Christ. His life was consumed by Christ. Uh, Jesus is our life as a Christian. He doesn't want just part and, uh, and, and a point here and there. He wants all of our life. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the 
life. He didn't say, I am a way. There's not a Muslim way and a Hindu way and a, and a, a Buddhist way. There's one way to Jesus Christ, contrary to what the news media may try to tell you. Don't, isn't it strange how they try to be theologians? <laughs> I, I sometimes watch uh, Bill O'Reilly on Fox News and Bill says some things that are pretty good and then sometimes he tries to be a theologian. And when he tries to become a theologian, he just goes way off out yonder and flying around in outer space and hasn't got a clue. And uh, the people want to tell us, movie stars, Hollywood actors and singers want to tell us how we ought to believe theologically. And uh, it's not their business, that's God's business. And Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but my, by me. He said, I am the truth. There is no truth outside of Christ. Anything that contradicts the word of God is untruth. I can guarantee you that. It's only the word of God. Jesus wants to be all in all. And uh, he, in this passage that we just read, he puts it this way. First of all, in verse number 3, he tells us that we've been crucified with Christ. We've been put to death. If you're saved today, you have been put to death. You've been crucified with Christ. You died the day you got saved. When I got into the baptistry and when I got buried in that watery tomb, <laughs> that was a funeral service showing that the old Rick Brooks died and a new Rick Brooks has been resurrected. It was a funeral service, and I had one person there mourning uh, my death that day. You know who it was? It was the dirty devil. He hated to see his good friend die. <laughs> I became a new creature in Christ, and uh, I've been crucified. And if you're, if you're a saved person today, you've been crucified too. You died that day. Then he tells us a second thing, that we've been raised with Christ in Verse number uh, one, it says, if ye then be, what's the next word? Risen with Christ. So we're dead with him, and we are risen with him. And then it tells us a third thing in this passage, that we live with him. Look at it again in verse number three. For ye are dead, now watch this, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Don't you like that? I do. I like that. That tells me not only have I died with Christ, I have been resurrected with Christ, but I have my life in Him, and it's all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that I'm in Christ and in God. And so that means when you're saved, friend, the good thing about this is for the devil to get to you after you're saved, he's got to go through Christ, through God the Father to get to you. I don't know about you, but I got more faith in God the Father and God the Son than I do by, in the devil and his power. And then the Bible says in Ephesians that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So we're pretty safe there, don't you think? Now, go back to chapter 2 in your Bible, if you would. Chapter 2, and look at verse number 3. Here's a wonderful verse. I hope God will write this verse upon your heart. Watch this, what it says about the Christian. It says... Of, of, of Christ in whom are hid in who? Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge what does that mean? that means that there is nothing listen to me there is nothing outside of Christ that's worth anything there is no knowledge outside of Christ that's worth knowing there is no action, no life outside of Jesus what I'm trying to say is as a Christian we are to be all consumed with Jesus Christ. He's to be our all in all. Now, in chapter 3, and verse number 1, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, I want you, I want you to see three verbs in our passage of Scripture. Three verbs, and then we're going to make a, a three points out of this to center on this morning. Number 1, we find it in verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, look at this first verb, seek those things which are above. Number two, the second verb, is in verse number two. Set, that's the verb, underline it. Set your affection on things above. And then third, we find it in verse number five. Mortify therefore. The word mortify is the third verb I want you to notice. And if you mark in your Bible, you can underline that one. So there, if you want to uh, alliterate those three points, you could say seek, set, and slay. Set your affections, 
Seek those things which are above and then slay those unholy lusts. Now, these three things I'm going to set out for you this morning from this passage of Scripture, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. I really believe that this can change the life. If you're one of those Christians that has not found joy in the Christian life yet, and all it is is just a hardship to try to live for the Lord, this can change your life. Notice number one. Jesus, if I'm, a, if, I'm a, if I'm a believer who Christ is my all in all, all three of these points will apply to this phrase. If Christ is my all, if he's everything to me, then number one, Jesus captivates my ambition. Jesus captivates my ambition. Look at verse 1 again. If you, be then, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now let me ask you a question. Where, where is your ambition? Where is your ambition? If your ambition is like it says in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Is that your first ambition, to seek Christ first? Oh, listen, I don't know, I don't know at the heartaches that I've seen over my years of being a pastor, an associate pastor. I was associate pastor for, for about 15 years. Now I've been a pastor for 15 years. And I don't know at the untold heartaches I've seen when people set out to make a decision and they put their emotions ahead of the Word of God and the will of God. You hear what I'm saying? I have seen more hearts broken. I've seen more families broken. I've seen more dreams broken by people who say, well, I know what the Word of God says, and I know, I know what maybe the preacher would tell me, but I know what I want too, and I deserve to be happy. <laughs> and so they focus upon their temporary happiness instead of put, making Christ all in all. Now here's the question. If Christ is your all in all, you'll seek him first. That will be your ambition. I wish somebody would say amen right there. He will be your ambition if Christ is first. Now here the, the writer of Colossians is thinking about those things on earth in chapter 2. If you, if you look at chapter th 2, he's talking about the things on earth, all the unhappy, unsavory things of earth in chapter 2. And then he comes to chapter 3 and he says that those things, chapter 2, are not the things that our ambition should be centered on. But our ambition should be on Christ and Him alone. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, But if you be risen in Christ, seek those things which are above. So the things of this world that we may be prone to seek are found in chapter 2. Look at uh, chapter 2 and verse number 8. Watch this with me. I hope you believe the Word of God because there is no truth outside of this. This is it. Chapter 2, verse number 8. Here's what the Apostle says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, beware. Now, anytime you see the word beware, what does that, what does that do? That gets our attention. He's saying, be careful. Watch out right here. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Well, there's a lot of that going on in the world today, isn't there? Lots of philosophy. Lots of vain deceit. And then he says, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, the word rudiment means the basics, the ABCs, <coughs> or the basic elements. And then he says, and not after Christ. Did you see that? He said, when they, when they point you to philosophy and not after Christ, that's when you've got to beware. That's where we go astray. And that word spoil means to carry captive. In the olden days, uh, when, when the kingdom would battle against kingdom and uh, one king would go in and conquer that little kingdom, he would spoil the city or carry away captive. They would kidnap a lot of the people. The Roman armies would do that. And they would lead their captives out of the city and, and enslave them. And uh, so the reasonings of the world is one of those things that, uh, that will, will, will cause us to have our affections off of Christ. Number two, the rituals of the world. 
Not only the reasonings, but the rituals. Verse in chapter two, we're still there. Chapter thirteen, I'm sorry, chapter two, verse thirteen. And you, being dead in your sins and the circum uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened? That means made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. That's talking about Jesus' death on the cross. When he died on the cross, he did away with the traditions, he did away with the, uh, with the rituals, all those Jewish rituals that they had, they had to go through rituals. <laughs> and, uh, and those rituals were only shadows. And people many times are living in the shadows of reality. And it's the reality that we ought to seek. Now verse 16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, that means any kind of food, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or in the Sabbath days, or... Uh, then it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So he's talking about all of those rituals. Christianity and living for Christ is far more than rituals. Now, next Sunday night, we'll observe the Lord's Supper. There's two ordinances in the, in the church, we believe, according to the Scriptures, and that's baptism for the believer and then observing the Lord's Supper. Those are the two. And they are ceremonies. But some churches have ceremony after ceremony after ceremony, and they go through all of these rituals, counting beads and, and saying uh, 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 rote memorizations and so forth, and uh, kneel, kneel, stand, and pray, kneel, stand, and pray, and going back and forth doing all of these rituals, going through all of the different ceremonies time after time after time, and they believe that that earns them favor with God. Can I just tell you that for those who may not be saved, rituals will not get you any closer to God. There is one thing. The Bible says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Salvation is a simple act of believing in the heart. When we turn our back on the way we have lived and turn to Christ by faith, that's salvation in our heart when we receive him and accept him. It has nothing to do with rituals and ceremonies. Getting in that baptistry will not save anybody. It's only a symbol. It's a ceremony of being born again. The moment we believe in our heart, we're saved. Then getting into the baptistry, it is a step of obedience, but it has nothing to do with getting us saved. It has to do with showing that we are saved. And let me take it a step further. Listen to this. Are you with me? Is it too warm in here? Is anybody going to sleep yet? All of you that are asleep, raise your hand. Okay, just one. Uh, I guess we're okay on the temperature. The, uh, not only do rituals not save people, rituals do not necessarily bring you any closer to Christ as a Christian either. Did you hear that? These Jews were trying to reach back and pull in some of their old ceremonies to make them feel religious. And that brings us to number three. The things of the world, not only those things that we just mentioned, but the religions of the world. Verses 18 and 19 in chapter 2. He says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Let no man beguile you of re reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head which, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered, knit together, increase, in, increaseth with the increase of God. Now what's he saying here? He's saying don't go running after some, some supposed angel. Lots of books being written on angels today. And there's some people who, who read and read and read and talk about angels. There's websites on the Internet given to the study of angels. Now, angels, angelology is, is a subject in the Bible, but Christ is all in all. There's nothing an angel can do for you that Christ cannot do better. Angels are just his servants. And people become absorbed with angels instead of Christ. And so he's saying about those things. Then number four, 
the things of the world in, in the fourth place are the regulations of the world. Look at verse number 20 in chapter 2. He says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, ye are subject to ordinances? That means laws, uh, rules, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. Now he's, he's not saying here that you ought not to, that you ought not to, in, that you ought not to refrain from indulging in the things that God has commanded us not to tamper with. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying that keeping of rules and regulations and having a list of don'ts is not necessarily going to make you Christ-like. So what are we talking about today? Let me, let, me, let me regain our focus once again. We're talking about making Christ our all in all, having happiness and joy and fulfillment in our Christian life, pleasing God by making Him everything in our life. So if Christ is supposed to be first in our life, we can't substitute rule keeping for loving God. Are you with me? Does that mean we ought to be rule breakers? That's not what we're saying. Let me give you an illustration. I knew, I knew a lady uh, years ago that after she was saved, she started going to a, a Baptist church that, that was, a, was a good church. And she, began, she heard some preaching on modesty. Probably ought to be a little more of that today. The, as my old pastor, Brother Jim Vineyard, used to say about this time of year, he'd say, well, okay, it's time to preach on modesty. We're heading into the burlesque season. <laughs> where everybody strips down and starts going naked. You know, it's easy to be modest in the wintertime, but then when it, hot weather comes, everybody starts stripping down. And uh, so this lady that I'm talking about, she heard some preaching on modesty. And so she changed the way she dressed, and, uh, and she began to dress in a more modest fashion. But to her, it was like drudgery, keeping this rule because that was what was expected in that church. Then after she left that church and went to another church, she went straight back to the old way that she used to dress. So what are we talking about? Keeping rules didn't change anything for her. If it's just keeping rules and not loving Christ, then it didn't do anything. Hey, we can make up a long list of rules. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing, but that doesn't necessarily make you more like Jesus. Are, are you following what I'm saying? Keeping a list of don'ts doesn't necessarily, it's like, let me give you an illustration. <coughs> uh, I, was, I was a builder years ago. And uh, when we built houses, we, we followed a blueprint. You had to have a plan to go by. Now, when I went out on the job, if I told my men, if all I told them was, all right, guys, don't cut, don't cut crooked marks, don't cook, cut crooked saw marks, don't make things out of level. Don't make things uh, off plumb. Don't, uh, don't use rotten studs in the wall. Don't, uh, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't bend nails. Don't do the other thing. If I, all I told them was what don't do, they would never get a house built. What do they need? They need a set of building plans. They need a... They need a, a, a a blueprint from the architect. They need something that they ought to be. And so that's the way it is in the Christian life. We need directions on how to love Him and how to live for Him. It's not all about what we don't do. I know a lot of people uh, who, who probably not even saved that keep a lot of good rules. But it doesn't make them Christ-like. See, this is the bottom line. Avoiding things doesn't necessarily make you more Christ-like. And that's what the scripture is saying here. Then there's, there's the figure of speech that's used in 1 Peter 3.18. He says about the Christian life, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can you imagine somebody, uh, maybe one of our older ladies that's raised a family going by a young lady, a young mother's home. They've just had a, they just had a new baby and, and, uh, and the young mother says, well, uh, can you tell me something about raising children? 
And the older lady says, well, don't give them, don't let them drink bleach, don't let them drink poison, don't let them drink medication, don't, uh, don't let them play in the street. You tell them everything, they don't do but Wait a minute. They need to know what to do, don't they? Uh, need to learn how to love that baby and uh, feed that baby some gravy and biscuits and ham and eggs and stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah that make them grow, right? Bacon. I, I saw a little poster the other day that had a picture of a dog and a, a little puppy dog and a little pig side by side. And the heading, the caption said, this was probably from PETA. They said, why eat one and treat the other like a pet? And this guy answered underneath of it and he said, because one of them is filled with delicious bacon and the other is not. <laughs> so a thousand don'ts will not make you like Jesus. To love him means to surrender to him. You know, it's why you do what you do and not necessarily doing the act itself. Like bumper sticker that you've seen. You've probably seen this bumper sticker before. It says, uh, uh, tithe if you love Jesus. Any fool can honk their horn. <laughs> it's the why behind If you love him. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you don't love him and you tithe, you know that's probably not making you any more like Jesus. We have to love him. Now, what we ought to do is seek him. Seek him. The Christian life is about seeking him. Like the needle on a compass seeks the north pole, Jesus ought to be the north pole on the compass of every Christian. Like the sunflower faces the sun, that's the way we ought to be. Did you, ever, did, did you know that when sunflowers are young, when the flower first buds out, that flower will turn towards the east in the morning and follow the sun across the sky until it goes down in the west. And in the nighttime, the flower swings back around to the east. Now, after they get more mature, the flower head gets big. It doesn't do that. It just remains facing the east after they're grown. But that little bud follows the sun across the sky. That's the way the Christian ought to be toward Jesus. We're after him, seeking him. Let me give you the next big point. Jesus dominates my attention and affection. Not only does he captivate my ambition, but he dominates my affection and my attention. Now, if our affection is set on Jesus, it will make a difference in the way we live and the way we feel. Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, as a, man thinketh, uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What's that saying? Whatever we think about, are you with me? Whatever we think about captures our affection. When a young man becomes infatuated with a young lady, man, his affection is centered on her all the time. The young man or a young lady that's infatuated with each other, man, all they do is gaze into each other's eyes. They get, they get to thinking they want to get married and they don't, they don't realize, that, you know, you might need a job. <laughs> we just live on love. <laughs> yeah. They don't think about maybe have to have a house to live in. Don't think about, you know, uh, what we're going to do with these kids when they're born. They, they just gaze into each other's eyes and that makes everything all right. Well, our attention, if we gaze upon Jesus, he will meet our needs, and that's, he needs to be the one that dominates our attention. Now, I'm not saying that everything that we do has to be church-related, no recreation. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that Jesus deserves to be in our thoughts and our affections in everything that we do, though. The things that we do, if we love him, it will have a huge effect on where we go, what we see, what we listen to, the friends we have, the, the work we do, and how we do it. If our affection is on him, it will change us. Number three, almost done. That was fast for number two, wasn't it? Hold the applause. Number three, Jesus regulates my actions. 
He regulates my actions. Notice in chapter 3 and verse number 5. Now we didn't read these a little while ago. Watch it with me. Chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. Watch this. Here's the things we put off as a Christian. Put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. Now, that word mortify means to put to death. Here's what we're talking about. I've already said in the, in the, in the earlier verses that will worship, rule keeping, does not necessarily make us more Christ-like. Remember that? Just just saying, I don't, I don't dip nor chew nor run with those who do. <laughs> when one preacher said, I don't dip nor chew nor run with women who do. I've seen, I've seen some women that dip and chew. When I was growing up, I saw some ladies that dipped rooster snuff, man. You remember the little glass jar? Some of you older folks will remember it. Uh, they'd dip out a little dip of that snuff and put it in their cheek and it out tobacco juice running down both corners of their mouth. Uh, somehow it just didn't uh, do a lot to turn me on, you know what I mean? <laughs> But abstaining from things doesn't necessarily make us more like Christ. I said that. The scripture says that. But here he gives us the attention to mortifying or putting to death those things that are detrimental. Why does he do that? If keeping rules doesn't necessarily make us more like Jesus, then why does he tell us some things that we ought to put off when we're in Christ? It's for this reason. Because the things that we do, the things we embrace, have a huge effect on how close or distant we'll be from the Lord Jesus. Are you with me? In other words, if I'm doing things that are wrong and are detrimental to me spiritually, then I'm going to have a harder time being close to Christ. There are some things that God hates. You knew that, didn't you? There are some things that God hates. And uh, if, if you were to turn to Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 16, you'd read this. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, I believe that has directly to do with abortion. Anybody that can't find abortion in the Bible hasn't read it very closely. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift, in running to mischief, and a false witness, uh, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. The Bible says God hates those things. Some people say that God loves, just, God's just love. Well, God is love, but there's some things he hates. And here's a list of them. If you went to Psalm 119, 104, the Bible says there, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. The psalmist said, because I read the scriptures and I find out what God hates, then I hate those things too. There's some things that God hates. God hates sin. God hates evil things. It doesn't mean that, that we ought to hate people. We ought to try to get people saved. Uh, sin is hateful. And if I want to be close to Christ, I have to be careful what I associate myself with. When I graduated from high school, this is in the dinosaur days. <laughs> this, is, this is when dinosaurs roamed the earth. I graduated in high school in 1969. <laughs> Sound like another millennia. Well, it was another millennia. <laughs> a thousand years ago. <laughs> when I graduated in high school, I wanted to be like everybody else. 
in the world. I was not a Christian then. And I, I wanted to look like and dress like and talk like and be in the places where worldly people were. I was a long-haired hippie type, if you can imagine me. If you can imagine me, I had old long, stringy hair hanging down on my shoulders, flipped up on the ends. That was in the days when it was cool to be a hippie. And uh, I, I, I finally decided to get it cut because I was working in construction. We were working in a, in a tunnel up in Batesville in the banquet food plant, and there was a, there was a tunnel where they brought railway cars in there, and, uh, and a couple of the men started... Uh, they couldn't see me well in the dark. They just saw my long hair and started lusting after me, and so I decided to get it cut. <laughs> I wanted to look like the world. I wanted to dress like the world. I wanted to be just like the world was. I wanted to be cool. And then I finally got saved. As we develop an affection for the things of the world, and listen, here's, here's where we're going. I said rule keeping does not make you more like Jesus. Remember that? But that doesn't mean that we swing the pendulum all the way to the other side and say, then it doesn't matter what I do. I can just love Jesus and be just like the sinful world. That's not, that's not logical either. Neither is it scriptural. When we swing our affections to the world, that takes away from the love that we have for Jesus. Let me read you a verse. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world. Now, when he says, love not the world, it's not talking about the trees and the mountains and the rivers, right? When he's talking about loving not the world, he's talking about loving the world system. The sinful, who is the prince of the power of the air? Who is the king of this world right now? It's not Jesus. It's the devil. The devil has dominion in the earth right now. That's scriptural. The king will come back one of these days and set up his kingdom. Jesus will come back, but right now the world system is run by the devil. Do you wonder why politics and the world situation is the way it is? It's because the devil's in charge of most of it. Hello. I don't care which party you belong to. There ain't, none of us can brag too much. Hello. It's a pretty sorry system, the world system. The world is generally a fallen, sinful world. And what people do. Has anybody noticed uh, the degradation in television? I mean, they, each year they say more and more vulgar words. Each year there's more and more nudity. Each year there's more and more disrespect of small children towards their parents? Well, that's because this world system is degraded because it's fallen in sin. And here's what I'm getting at. If we let the world dictate to us what we ought to love instead of Christ, then it takes away from the world uh, for the love that we have for Jesus. Let me read that verse again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Listen to this carefully. Listen to this right here. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The more I love the things of the world, the more I fall in love with the nudity and the, the sarcasm and the disrespect and the, uh, the spirit of anarchy, the more I fall in love with the vulgarity of this world and, and the styles that take me away from the Lord, the more I fall in love with that, the less love I have for the Lord Jesus. That's what the scripture says. Let me give you one other verse. You'll remember this one. Jesus said this, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love, or, or else hold to the one and despise the other. You can't have two masters. Either it's got to be the world or it's got to be Jesus. What does Jesus want? He wants to be our all in all. Jesus wants to have everything. He doesn't want his, his attention and affection divided so that we love the world on, on Monday and we love the Lord on Sunday. He wants us to love him equally every day of the week. And when we love the things of the world, if we dress and act like the world, parents, if you la allow your children to develop an, an appetite for the world, the time will come when they will love the world more than they love God and they'll drop out of church. 65 
to 85% of our young people graduate from high school, walk out the church house doors, and never come back. And that's a fact. I appreciate these guys sitting right here. They graduated from high school last night, and they're in church this morning on their own. Nobody made them come. They came because they love the Lord. And I appreciate that. And what I'm saying is, when we develop an appetite for the world, we will love Jesus less. And our affection and associations definitely affect what we think about the Lord. Paul said, evil communications... And the word communication is not talking about just what we say. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Communications is talking about the interaction with people in the world. The more unchristian interaction we have, the more we become corrupted. So what is the Christian life? It's not just coming to church and being spiritual on Sunday. What is the Christian life? It's letting Christ be our all in all. And tomorrow morning when I get out of bed and I speak to my wife, I'll be letting Christ live in me just like I did on Sunday. Hello? When you go to the job and the rest of the world on the job, maybe you work in a place where there's not a lot of Christians and they curse and tell their dirty stories and tell about the filthy movies they've watched. Instead of laughing with them, you'll find something else to do on Monday. So our affection for Christ, what does he want? He wants us to have him as our all in all. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer?